morning, I'm Catherine. This morning I'm going to uh, make a video about overcoming um, bipolar. This is uh, a video just with where I'm at at the moment. Um, other people may disagree with me but I'm just going to put down my thoughts which hopefully might help a few people. Um, when I was 21 I had um, an episode of uh, delusional um, thoughts. I had been uh, travelling in India, my mum had died when I was 18, I was um, a very, always a very sensitive person, an artist and uh, a person who cared a lot about other people and um, I, when I came back from India, even when I was in India I was getting increasingly increasingly sensitive and I remember coming on the ferry from um, Ramaswaram back to Sri Lanka where I was going to take the plane back to England and um, I'd met a, a guy who was um, a pathologist and he was very kind, he had his own van and he was travelling around India and he was a bit concerned about me and he spent time talking to me on the boat and I can remember thinking, I just need to get back to England, you know, something's not quite right with me. Anyway, as I went back to England, I think I became, uh, you know, I was more and more, in becoming more and more imbalanced. And when I got to the UK, my aunt came to pick me up and I thought that uh, my uncle was going to be king of an African country and various things happened. I'll just explain a little bit what happened to me and then I can explain how I recovered. Um, I, um, th I thought that there was a lot wrong with the country, which I still think there is by the way, and the way the world was being run and I took a very long letter which I drove up to the Houses of Parliament to deliver to Maggie Thatcher who was the um, Prime Minister at the time. Um, and I did various other things which were a bit imbalanced like going back to my old school and um, my uncle and aunt lived there and putting on the fire alarms in their house at which point um, my aunt who was a social worker at the time and um, there was a school doctor on the site they came and I was sectioned. Uh, from what I can remember it was the middle of the night because it was dark and I was taken away um, in a van with handcuffs on and I was taken to a, a place which I now know was uh, the Priory which was like an incredibly sort of posh hotel um, but I didn't know where I was at the time. Um, it looked like a very posh hotel room and um, I was taken there and then two men in white coats came in and with a big hypodermic uh, syringe they held me down and one of them um, put this syringe into my buttock and actually, well I think that's where it went um, that's the last I can remember and uh, when I came round um, bearing in mind I was 21, I was pretty fit my first plan was to get out of there because I thought they were trying to kill me. Um, there hadn't been any warning that anyone was going to try and kill me but ending up in that place which looked a bit like some kind of macabre film with men in white coats. Um, there weren't any doors that were locked so it was quite easy for, for me to escape and when I got out I scaled a huge fence which was um, I now know on the other side of Roehampton Lane from the Priory Hospital which is a well-known um, private mental hospital in um, Roehampton and um, I ran off as fast as I could. I actually began to recognise where I was. I recognised that I was close to Putney. I knew um, that area from living in Fulham and I found my way to a friend's house who lived, um, my friend's mother actually, who lived in Putney. So I got there and actually um, some kind of communication I imagine went on between my friend's mum and uh, my dad 
and a similar thing happened. I think somebody must have come round and collected me and taken me right back to the Priory, um, at which point I must have, I don't remember actually any of this, in fact I can't, I can't remember what happened for weeks after this, I think I must have been filled so full of drugs that my mind was uh, not, uh, you know, I, I just have no memory of that time, which is a bit tragic, and um, I was on one drug which was called Largactyl, which was orange and used to come around in a little, um, little like a little pill pot, which I used to have a measure of, and during that time I had at least two lots of electric shock therapy. Um, and I can't remember most of it. Um, I can remember going upstairs and seeing a game of chess going on in one of the other wards with the director of the film, um, The Go-Between, who happened to be in there at the same time as me. I should think there were quite a lot of imbalanced artists and musicians in the Priory. Um, I can remember we were given coffee to drink in the morning every day, which uh, coffee's never been very good for me and it didn't seem to do me a lot of good, so I sort of gave that up and I stayed there for a very long time until I decided that I didn't want any more of this orange Largactyl and that it wasn't doing me any good and that actually I seemed to be addicted to it and I spoke to one of the nurses about it and he said yes it was a very addictive drug so anyway I came out of there and I was determined to come off the drugs that I'd been put on during that time, one of which was Priodel, which is an antipsychotic, um, it's lithium, and I was told that I was going to have to be on that drug for the rest of my life to maintain some kind of stable uh, mentality. Um, I um, got a job, I was determined to do what I had trained to do, which was textile design, I worked as a cleaner in the Hurlingham Club in the mornings, and then I used to pick up the Guardian and the papers and have a look at the jobs when I finished at lunchtime and go back and um, and apply for jobs. And I eventually got an interview for a job with a company called Coconuts West Indies doing textile design, um, designing uh, t-shirts. Have a bit of a cup of uh, tea. Mm. Really nice. Holy basil. In... Um, mountain sage and um, a little bit of coconut and turmeric tea. Nice born morning blend for me. Um, and uh, I got a job, I was offered a job, it was in Battersea, it was winter time, it was snowing, my boss, uh, my future boss had come over from the Caribbean um, where he had a screen printing company in St Lucia and he was having a lot of problems with inks getting dried in the screens and he needed somebody with some technical ability to, to sort that out, which I had. So in in January, end of January, I think it was, or early February, I went off to the Caribbean to start my three months trial for this job. And I was determined that I was going to come off these lithium tablets, which I did little by little, and the um, work environment in the Caribbean was was very beautiful. I mean, I lived in a in a beautiful old colonial house, which is where we had our our um, design studio, print studio. My boss lived there. I lived there, um, and we ate really well. We had a lovely um, maid called Lucy who used to cook us a delicious lunch every day. Every day I went swimming in the sea one day or I went to play tennis and uh, I gradually cut down on these pills, I um, looked after myself, I went to bed early and I didn't really know much about diet or anything else then but I knew that I was getting better and that, you know, doing the sport and just concentrating on my work and having a few nice friends around was doing me a lot of good. So I carried on like that. After a year, I weaned myself off those uh, lithium tablets. I still um, felt that my mood was a bit up and down. What I would say is I was sensitive but because I was doing a lot of artwork, drawing, palm trees, parrots, 
birds of paradise, flowers. Um, I was very happy. I was in my element. A lot of my pictures were very joyful and my designs were very joyful and that gave me a very positive outlook. I came back um, from the Caribbean, I got married um, to a guy that I met over there and we came back to live in the south of France. I carried on my art and um, we built a squash club over there together which wasn't a very um, well conceived project and we got into financial difficulties and actually um, we had our beautiful son together and when he was three I came back to the UK. That's when I really started in earnest to get into what was going to help me to get my health better because I had a lot of digestive problems, I had a lot of emotional upsets, I had a lot of uh, trauma from um, various things that I've been to, through. I think trauma affects people in different ways. I think sometimes small traumas can um, be big for, for one person and hardly noticeable for somebody else. And for me, small things were big. So I had to learn to address that. And I went to see a beautiful um, nutritionist called Katie Boland who lived near... It's somewhere near Hammersmith, um, a Bolingbrook Road or somewhere like that. Anyway, um, she, she lived somewhere near there and, and she was great. And she said to me, basically, you need to do an elimination diet. You need to find out what your food sensitivities are. And um, it would be a good idea if you did coffee enemas to clear out your system from the drugs that you've taken and um, really think about your diet and she also uh, recommended other things and at the same time I saw a, ho a homeopath who a friend of mine had recommended to me who was called Charles Wandsborough who was a lovely guy who lived in Putney and he was a, an ex-dentist whose health had really suffered through practicing dentistry he was suffering from mercury poisoning and uh, he was a very compassionate man and he helped me too and I went on this elimination diet. I had a lot of uh, <laughs> I had a lot of emotional problems eliminating food. I can remember being on a weird diet. I had um, a book that I, the name of which I can't remember now, but it was a book written by two doctors, and they suggested to start with a, a lamb and pears diet. So that's what I did. I ate. I wasn't a vegetarian then, and I ate lamb and pears in just about every form you could possibly imagine and got very tired of that and then you moved on to introducing another food those were supposed to be the foods that were the the ones that you were least likely to get a reaction to so that's what I did anyway um, I did that and I can remember at the time going to a party at a friend of mine's house where there was masses and masses of pasta that was all there really was to eat and some salad and just getting really upset that um, I couldn't eat anything and there was lovely cakes and things that all these other people were eating. I, uh, that was actually, for me, one of the biggest uh, problems with the whole uh, plan was that my emotional reaction to restricting myself um, from the pleasures of life, which I saw my family and everyone else still indulging in. So anyway, I managed to kind of get over that and keep going and I used to walk around with uh, tubs of food, um, brown rice with uh, vegetable stews and um, I gave up dairy products and I was virtually a vegan at aged um, 30. I took up yoga, I used to go to the Shivananda Yoga Centre and I remember going down there and doing their it was two hours once a week, it was called Yoga One and then I did Yoga Two and it was with a lovely uh, Swami and um, uh, he came from former Yugoslavia, I can't remember his name now but I should, 
and uh, he was such an inspiration and we were all women doing this course together and I remember feeling so sick <laughs> walking over Putney Bridge and feeling so sick to get there and then walking back feeling so in my Doc Martin boots feeling so light and feeling after this two hours of yoga that life was worth living again so I was building up um, various tools that I could use to, to make my life uh, better my dad at the time lived in Fulham um, at that time, um, my son and I, after, um, I tried to get a job, but um, doing something to do with what I did, art and textiles and things like that, but that didn't work. So I, um, my dad had sweetly paid for my son to go to a nursery school in Fulham um, <clears throat> for a month <clears throat> while I did some job applications. And uh, the the lady who ran the nursery school would ask me when she saw me every couple of days, oh, how are you getting on with your job hunt? And it was always the same, oh, you know, rejection after rejection. <laughs> and um, she said, well, my housekeeper's leaving. Would you like to come and live with us here and um, and take the housekeeper's job? So I'm like, well, yeah, that would be great because I could cook and like children and everything else and it gave me and my son a place to live. So we went to live there um, just by Eelbrook Common on Parsons Green, so I was close to my dad and uh, I knew that area from before. And she was a lovely person and her kids were similar age to my son and he could go to the nursery school in the afternoon and go to another school in the morning. And so again, I I had a stability there, and I was still on my on my diet. She was quite worried about me. She um, I had it was 1990. I remember the Gulf War was on, and I can remember all these announcements and thinking this is really wrong. And she, I had a sort of flu thing, which is what would happen. I would just recurrently get flu-like symptoms and have to go to bed and be really sick. So she thought it would be a great idea for me to have some glucose tablets. So she bought me all these various flavours of glucose tablets, but that didn't seem to really help. I know she had, uh, she had definitely had good good intentions. She was only trying to help me, um, but I had to go back on to my restricted diet, and I was cooking for the kids. So I used to cook myself um, things which were I knew were going to be okay for me. And eventually I was made redundant from that job because she closed the nursery and I was rehoused and I went to live in a bed and breakfast in Turnham Green, which was actually great um, because it was, a, it was a nice room overlooking the Piccadilly line with a little bathroom and a kitchen. And I was still going back once whenever I, I could every few months to see this nutritionist and I was getting more the idea and I would go to the health food shop in Hammersmith and I think I, I think that's where I, I can't remember what, what, what it was called and I used to look at books and um, people gave me books on health and eliminate, elimination diets and all this kind of thing and gradually I felt like I was getting better you know I was I, I was my digestive system was a little bit, was getting better. Um, I won't go through all the symptoms, but, you know, kind of runny symptoms, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, they would call it. And during all this time, I was um, doing my yoga. I started meditation when I was 30, and I would do some meditation. I started one minute a day, and I just kept it going and kept it going and kept it going and built up to five minutes a day, which is what I would suggest is a really good idea. I always tried to do things which I felt that I could continue. And I came into contact with a spiritual organisation in Fulham, which was founded by George King, and that was a real help. I had healing from them, which was by donation, and I had a kind of spiritual focus. Um, we used to do services for helping the world, sending out energy, saying prayers, and all of that clicked with me because um, I, re I was just realising more and more that the world that I was living in um, 
didn't sit well with me. I saw a doctor who was very helpful and she sent me for a barium enema which was a, a bit of a nightmare and personally I wouldn't recommend that but she was also helpful. I told her that all the alternative things that I was doing were working and she encouraged me to carry on doing that so I did. Um, I think she got me some counselling which was helpful and she was generally a very supportive GP and I was then rehoused um, in a housing association flat in Kensington Garden Square which was great because my son he's half French and he was a student he was when he was small at nursery school at the French Lycée which was in Kensington because he was French he got a free place there and this doctor had been in Fulham and was then just round the corner from where I lived in in uh, Kensington in Bayswater so that was handy being able to see her and I can remember always being a bit in and out of a feeling of desperation. It was like, I'm a, I'm a highly intelligent person, you know, I'm a person who's got very good results. A level at school, um, A's and B's, I'm, I'm like a person who's been to university, I'm a person who left university and went to art college, I'm a person who's, who's had a job, I've always worked for my living. And um, I um, decided to become a, a self-employed artist um, and did a little business course for a month. And then I started doing my artwork, which was mainly for wealthy people, painting house portraits and painting furniture for kids, which was, was enjoyable work and I could do it while my son was at school. And there were people from the school who commissioned me to do things so I kept going like that looking after him and gradually you know getting better and better but still I'm giving you the whole story you know still not feeling right still being very very feeling very different from the rest of my family having to really look after myself uh, not drinking um, not uh, smoking, not having any stimulants, no tea, no coffee, because if I had those things I could feel that they didn't have a good effect on my body and my mind. It was like I was already a very buzzy, very um, stimulated person, so I didn't need those um, extra stimulants, they, they didn't do me any good. So I came off all of that, and I was like a a person who was like doing all the things that everybody else wasn't doing and they were doing all the things that I wasn't doing. You know, if I went to a party, I would pretty much always take my own food just in case there was something that wasn't there or if I was invited out to dinner, I'd take my tub with my brown rice and my vegetables and my my little tub of hummus or my um, chickpeas or my... Um, all the things which I'd learnt were good for me, my um, rinsed sunflower seeds so that they didn't have um, mould on them. I had identified over those uh, couple of years that I had a condition called candida overgrowth which affected all sorts of different things. My digestive system, my mental state, my emotional state, everything was affected by this. And like a, a big craving for sweet stuff, which I had to um, give up all sugar, all refined flours, wheat. And again, when I did this, I, I felt better. Um, so I was, I was encouraged to carry on, but when I used to go to you know, Christmas at my family's or something like that and they were all tucking into their Christmas cake and Christmas pudding and and uh, by this stage I'd also become vegetarian because I thought that that seemed again to be the way to go because of the antibiotics in meat and I wasn't keen on the way that animals were treated but I was becoming uh, more and more restricted in my diet, positively restricted I would say, um, but to keep to that in a culture where you know, you you only had to walk down Fulham Road or Hammersmith High Street and every other shop is a cafe selling muffins and coffee and teas and sandwiches made with wheat bread. And in those days, there was really pretty much nothing that you could get apart from in a health food shop, 
which was any kind of alternative. And um, when you when I went out, the options would be like a baked potato, probably with baked beans, which I knew had sugar in them, but a, probably that was like a better option than anything else with salad. Um, I think I did um, sometimes eat a bit of fish in those days if I went somewhere because it was otherwise it was very restrictive what I was eating. And I just kept this discipline with the yoga, with um, meditation, going to spiritual services every week, looking after my son who um, at, this, at this time I would cook, he would have meat, he would have the healthiest things I could make for him. I'm not really focusing this video on him but what happened with me impacted him because he was only young, he was three in 1990. I used to make smoothies in the morning with, um, uh, I moved again back to Fulham to Greyhound Road into a little flat which belonged to a friend of mine and I got a job working for somebody who I met at the spiritual group um, who sold Klamath Lake Blue Green Algae and antioxidants, an incredibly powerful blend of antioxidants and also probiotics. So um, working for him, he taught me some computer skills and I started to learn more about nutrition. There were lots of practitioners who used to buy the algae to give to their patients. And so I was in an environment where I was learning more about health. So I used to give my son the smoothies. He didn't like breakfast. So the only thing I could get to hand him in the morning before he went to school was a smoothie. And um, that, again, I began to be realise that I was not really um, a part. I was a part of the system that I was living in. But it never sat well with me. There was too many things going on, you know, homeless people on the street. Um, I was lucky enough to have a little flat and to to be able to, with the small amount of money that I had, um, I was on family credit, so I worked a little bit and I had some benefits and I had housing benefits because of my son. I had a very, very small income. I didn't need very much because we never really had a very lavish lifestyle, you know, we stepped up. We had a a season ticket to Kew Gardens, which we'd had from when we were in the Housing Association place in the bed and breakfast. And uh, we used to go there, we used to go for walks along the river. Um, we used to meet up for friend, with friends and go to the park. So our, our lifestyle wasn't lavish. And um, when I went to my family, you know, um, they, they were just close by as well. So um, kept living like that, kept doing the yoga, little by little things started to get better but there was still something very underlyingly um, imbalanced with my health. Eventually went to live with um, my boyfriend partner who down in Bristol in and um, uh, for a couple of years. I had also had a relationship with him before I went to the Caribbean and he was actually part of this spiritual group um, in Fulham which I used to attend and my son went to a lovely school in the country and my, my partner was um, quite alternative thinking. We did yoga, we did meditation, he, I did most of the cooking, he was quite happy to have healthy food. We had simple healthy food, then I got a job looking after a lady who I knew who was very alternative thinking as well, looking after her children, picking them up from school and cooking for them and looking after vegetables and growing them in her garden. So that was all, you know, really good. Um, I remember at that time being, I've always been like this, feeling a sense of urgency that something was very wrong um, with the world that we were living in and feeling that I really wanted to do more about that. And so I retrained as a homeopath, no, I say retrained, I mean I trained as a homeopath. It was my second sort of educational training. And I started at a college called the British School of Homeopathy, which at that time was in Bristol, which is where I was living. And I would go on my bike one weekend a month and 
um, learn about plants and remedies and from an amazing group of people I was so inspired um, learning homeopathy although two of the best tutors Mike Bridger and another lady actually left to set up their own college um, during that first year and I really liked the two of them so missed not being able to um, have their tuition but there were other very good people who came Mo Morish was one of the um, very inspiring teacher for me and I learnt so much there um, I actually left that college because um, I went to live back in London I did commute down for some weekends but I went to I, I worked from a homeopathic bookshop owned by somebody called Stuart McCohen in um, in Hammersmith just by the hospital and I went with him two years running to help him at the homeopathic conference at Keele University run by the Society of Homeopaths and I heard some amazing speakers there and one of the speakers was um, Ian Watson who was a very powerful influence to me all of this is relevant to my recovery because the homeopathy I started to take homeopathy I started to um, talk to other homeopaths and realize um, more and more about the conditions that I was suffering from that it was a whole you couldn't separate them out into parts and um, Ian I decided that I wanted to go to his, the college that he ran, he'd set up with Anne Waters, which was called the Lakeland College of Homeopathy, which was just starting, actually, um, courses down in London. So I went to the first year of the courses that they started, and because 